So I've got Billy Graham with me tonight, and it's going to be fire. We're going to preach really about the end times. If you're taking notes, you could just write this down at your house. Are you ready for the end? Are you ready for the end? God spoke to me a couple weeks ago that I would be shifting some of the messages I'm preaching. I had certain messages prepared that I was going to share with our church over these next several weeks. Well, then when COVID-19 began to escalate, all of a sudden God really began shifting everything that I was preparing for. And one of the messages that God started stirring in my heart is to preach on end times. And so last week I preached with my father and we preached about Psalm 91. It was a powerful message. If you missed it, you need to listen to it, watch it. But one of the messages I wanted to preach to you is really about getting ready for where we're at in the world right now, the end times that we're in. And I was watching some of Billy Graham's old messages and I came across this message. Um, again, hopefully our TV works here, guys. Pray at home. Everything was working earlier today. But I came across one of these messages from Billy Graham and it's a message all about the end. So I'm gonna jump right into it. I want you to hear what he has to say. And then every few minutes, I'm gonna pause it and we're gonna talk about it. Here we go. Even thus, listen to this, even thus, shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. As it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Sodom, so it's going to be similar to the days just before the coming again of Christ. Yes, I believe the Bible teaches in more than 300 places in the New Testament that Jesus Christ is coming back again. That's the hope that beats within the heart of every true believer. Christ was raised from the dead. He is alive. He is at the right hand of God the Father, and he's coming back. Now, don't ask me when, because I don't know. He told the disciples, don't try to guess the day nor the hour. Don't speculate. We don't know. But he left us certain signs, and it seems to me that these signs are coming together for the first time, perhaps in history, since he said it. All the signs seem to be there that the coming of the Lord draws near. We don't know, we're not sure, but it seems that way. Because one of the things that he told us was that the Middle East would be in turmoil. He told us about the pestilences. Look at all that's happening in pestilences. He said the whole world. Now I want to stop right there. The word pestilence actually means a plague, a virus, a sickness of some kind. So here Billy Graham is talking in 1985. That's the year I was born. And he's actually preaching in Tacoma, Washington. Right now the state where this virus really began to take off in America. Now we know it started in China and then began to move globally. But when it got to America, it really took off in Washington state. And now, right now, New York is experiencing a very strong uh, epidemic of this. In fact, I wanna pray right now for all of the states that have been hit the hardest. As you're at home, some of you have family members, relatives, friends that live in New York. And we just pray in Jesus' name for New York. We pray, God, for just the doctors, the nurses, the families that have been affected by those who've lost loved ones right now because of this pestilence, this sickness. And I pray in Jesus' name, God, that your power would be manifested in people's lives. Those who are sick right now would be healed. I pray, God, for this virus to reverse in Jesus' name. I pray for those in California, in Washington, in Florida, every state that's been hit the hardest. I pray in Jesus' name, God, that there's going to be a turning around. I pray for protection, and I pray for your peace and comfort for those who've lost their loved one, those who are feeling discouraged, hopeless, depressed right now. In Jesus' name, God is with you. God is with you. You know, as Billy Graham is preaching this message, it's 1985. That's, what is that, 30, almost 35 years ago that he was preaching this message. And yet here we are, and our world is facing many of the things they were facing then. Honestly, this gives me hope, because in 1985, they thought the world was going to end. There was wars, rumors of wars. There was turmoil in the Middle East. There was earthquakes. Now, I'm not saying that where we're at right now is a long ways away from Jesus returning. I personally believe Jesus is coming back soon. And this is a message to get ready. And if you're a believer, this is a hope-filled message to know you are ready. And there is nothing that can shake you in this hour. 
But you know, I think about how he's preaching this and he's talking about what the end times is referred to. Jesus talked about how in the end times there will be wars, there will be turmoil, there will be pestilences. Pestilence is a, a disease, a virus, a plague. Now we know Jesus, God is not the author of sickness and death and darkness. It's not, the end times is not an indicator that God is doing all these bad things. The end times is an indicator that the world is groaning for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed and that Jesus is gonna come back in the midst of all of this pain, all of this darkness, you need to know we still have the victory. We are not defeated, we are not defeated, we are not defeated. But I want you to hear what he has to say here. And again, I think it's so powerful that we can look back and hear a message that's still relevant and very relevant right now for the time that we're in. The whole world will be in turmoil. Look at the terrorism that's going on in the world and the tremendous military buildups around the world. All of these things, he said, are indications that the coming of the Lord is near. Because you see, the world would destroy itself if God doesn't intervene. But I believe the Bible teaches that God has other plans for the human race. I believe that Christ is coming again and the kingdom of God is going to triumph. And those of us that know Christ and have the kingdom of God within us, we are going to reign with Christ. I'm looking forward to that day when he comes again. And he said two will be in the bed, one taken, the other left. Two might be flying in an airplane, one taken, the other left. Now, the road to Armageddon is similar to the road to the destruction of Sodom, said Jesus. Now, notice they had that false security. We have a false security, too. We trust in our economic strength and our military power. All of that could go in a, just a moment. Isaiah, the 31st chapter in the first verse says, Woe to them that go to a pagan country for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots, but they look not unto God, neither seek the Lord. They're not looking to God. We're not seeking the Lord. We're trusting these other things. We're trusting in our dollars and in our pounds, trusting in our military power. And these things will not save us. We need God. We need to seek the Lord. This is what Isaiah was saying. And then the second thing, they had a false sense of security, but they were involved in sinful pleasure. They had become satiated. We too are that way. And the Bible warns the triumphing of the wicked is short and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment. It's only a moment in time. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, there is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is the way of death. It seems right to go this way, but the end is death, God says. Even in laughter the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. Even when you're laughing sometimes, aren't you sad? And then when you pick up the papers and watch the news, and all the murders that are going on and all the things that are taking place, I hear people say every day, they, they just cannot understand it. And then the scripture says that the people of Sodom were too busy for God. They were too busy making a living and having all their pleasures to give any time to God. And that's the way we are. I wanna stop right there because he's now hit on three things that leading up to the end times, people will be worshiping three different things. They'll be uh, worshiping their own activities, like he said, just so busy. They'll be idolizing their own sin, so they'll be living in their own sin. And the Bible says as the, end time, as the times grow closer and closer to the return of Jesus, there's gonna be an increase of hate. There's gonna be an increase of sin, an increase of uh, uh, lustful living and just darkness. We're seeing that. In fact, this week I watched as John Bevere, Lisa Bevere, so many different pastors that I follow and that I'm connected to begin to post on their Instagram an old prophecy from David Wilkerson. David Wilkerson came and preached at our church many years ago. He's the man who led uh, a gang member, Nikki Cruz, to Christ. They came out with a movie back in the 80s, 90s called Cross and the Switchblade. And I remember when David Wilkerson and Nikki Cruz came to Victory and preached and my dad interviewed them. and. 
David Wilkerson had a vision from God in the 70s that one day in the future, there would be a plague, a virus that would hit the world and it would affect the entire world. It would shut down businesses, bars, even churches would be closed in a week. He was prophesying this in the 70s. And he said, in this time, people will lose hope. People will be afraid. People will be living in worry and panic. And it will lead into the third great awakening for revival. Come on, I'm telling you right now, we are seeing that revival in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You need to tell your friends to tune in right now because this is a word from God. We are in the end times. We don't know how close we are to Christ's return, but we're looking around and everything we're seeing is lining up with exactly what Jesus prophesied, exactly what Billy Graham is sharing leading up to this. Now, Billy Graham passed away just a year ago. And I think like God is up to something. In the midst of all of this crisis, God is waking up his church. You know, I think about the story in World War II, Pearl Harbor, when our nation was hit that day, 1946, Pearl Harbor happened and it, was, it just shook our entire nation. I wasn't alive back then, obviously, but I remember reading in our history books and in my history book, one of the big lines on that page is, I fear all we have done is awakened the sleeping giant. And I think about right now, the enemy thinks he's trying, he's gonna take out all the churches, but I want the enemy to know he has awakened a sleeping giant. And that sleeping giant is the church. And the church is waking up and the church is breathing revival like never before. Come on, somebody! I'm gonna preach to myself in this TV screen tonight. Listen, I know the technology uh, stuff is kind of glitching, but I just, I feel like this is a word in season. And I feel like you need to hear what he has to say. Um, but I just wanna hit on these three things. He says, they're gonna be, in the end times, people are gonna be worshiping their own sin. They're gonna, they're gonna be holding on to their own sin. They're gonna be living a busy life saying, I don't have time for God. And the, and the, the first thing he said, which would be the third one here, is he said, um, they're gonna have their faith in their economics. They're gonna have their faith in their money, their banks, the stock market. What we're seeing right now is all three of those things are being rocked. The addictions that people would go to right now, they don't have the money to buy. And, and they're being frightened by some of those addictions. The, the, the casinos are closing down, can't gamble right now. There's stores that are shutting down, businesses, the economy is in this crazy time and turmoil. And, and then people who said, I don't have time, now it's like God saying, I'm giving you time because now you're all at home and you have an option now to spend time with God, to get right with God. Now watch what he says next. We don't give God first place in our lives. God doesn't demand a legalistic system under which we live, but he does demand first place in our lives. He wants to be the Lord that sits on the throne of your life and controls your life and rules your life. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and shed his blood so that our sins could be forgiven. Because you see, the problem in the world today is pronounced with one word, sin. And the Bible says we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We were born in sin. We're sinners by choice and we're sinners by practice. And that sin separates between you and God so that you don't have the sense of fulfillment. You don't know the purpose and the meaning of your life. And you can have all these kicks and all these pleasures, but it doesn't satisfy. Something deep down inside is crying for something more. It doesn't solve the problem of your home. It doesn't solve the problem of your unemployment. Something is out of kilter. Something is wrong. And then they were guilty of idolatry idolatry. That's the sin that God hates the most, and that's the sin of the Western world today, and it's the sin of the whole world. Romans 1.25 says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator. And anything in your life that takes the place of God becomes your God. 
Anything that you think more of and takes your time more than the living God becomes your God. And then the next thing that they were guilty of was sex perversion. One of the last directions that a nation takes before judgment is this, usually found in an affluent society, not normal sex relations, perversions of various sorts, trying to find new ways to get kicks out of sex. That's the full-time occupation of many people. And you go to the newsstands today and you see magazine after magazine dedicated to that, trying to find some new angle, some new way. Now, in the midst of all this place, Sodom lived Lot. He had chosen Sodom to make his home. And the Scripture says that he was miserable and he was vexed. You see, Lot's trouble was that he had one foot in the kingdom of God, and the other foot in a sinful world, and he was caught between. He wasn't happy in the sinful world, and he wasn't happy in the kingdom of God. And there are many of you like that. You go to church, you're a member of a church, and you believe in God with your head, and once in a while you read the Bible, and you have a religious outward appearance, but deep inside your heart, you know that your heart belongs to the world, the cosmos, this world system, which is dominated by evil. Many of you have a Christian heritage. Your parents were Christians. You learned from the Bible in school. And you are now a man or a woman of the world or a young person. But you're never really satisfied with your relationship to God. Something's wrong. Something's lacking. Something's missing. You know what it is? Maybe you haven't been born again. Maybe you haven't really received Christ totally and completely as your Lord and Savior. And tonight, on this last night of this tremendous mission, is your night to make that commitment. We have hope in Christ. We have something to offer people. A new day, a new kingdom, a new world. A new world is going to be born, a new heaven and a new earth. And we're going to be a part of it because we're in his kingdom. But Jeremiah wept over Jerusalem because he saw judgment was coming, and he was called a weeping prophet. Jesus wept over Jerusalem 700 years later, and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen doth gather a brood under her wings? But you would not. You wouldn't listen to me. You wouldn't come to me. And now you're in for judgment. God warns Sodom, and he sent two messengers to warn them. But Lot's wife didn't believe, but he did. The messengers warned the wife, said, don't look back. Lot's wife disbelieved and turned into a pillar of salt as she had been warned. The wrath of God was poured out on Sodom and Lot's wife. And Abraham knew it was coming, and he prayed, and he said, Lord, if you could find 50 righteous people in Sodom, would you save it? God said, yes. 45, yes. 30, yes. 20, yes. 10, yes. But he couldn't find 10 righteous people, 10 people totally committed to God, so the judgment came. Now, what is the lesson we learn from that statement? remember Lot's wife. Why did Jesus say it? First, remember she was the wife of Abraham's nephew, and she had lived in Abraham's tent. And many times she had seen the power of God, and to whom much is given, much is required. And then secondly, remember what a wrong marriage can do. She was a Canaanite, and God had forbidden his people to marry these pagan tribes round about them. How many men and women have been destroyed by marrying the wrong person who influenced them the wrong way? That's the reason you should marry God's choice. And then thirdly, I think Jesus said it, because we're to remember her sin. It seems such a small sin, but it represented something far deeper 
It represented unbelief over many years. It represented rebellion against God on many occasions. God in His mercy was giving her another chance, and God said, don't look back. Don't look back to Sodom. Sodom is controlled by the devil. Don't look back, but she couldn't help it. Her heart was still in Sodom, even though she was escaping the judgment. Her sin didn't seem to be so great just to look back, but it was something deeper inside of her that caused her to look back. And then remember fourthly that she was almost saved. They were at the gate of Zor, the city of refuge. You see, in those days, they had cities where people could run to if they'd committed a crime or committed murder until they could get their lawyers set and get everything organized uh, because people would lynch them or stone them just with the drop of a hat in those days. So there were cities of refuge that they could run to, and they were right on the edge of Zor when she turned and looked back. And it was that moment she turned into a pillar of salt. Now, the Bible says that Agrippa, the great king, heard Paul preach, and he was almost persuaded, but he hardened his heart. Many of you are almost persuaded to give your life to Christ, but you're going to take a chance that you can make it without it. Some of you are. And then fifthly, remember that she was offered salvation. Christ is the place of salvation and refuge. It's at the cross where God poured out His love and where our sins were borne by Christ. He was made to be sin for us who knew no sin. He took your sins and my sins. He took my judgment. He took the hell that I deserved on that cross. And when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was because God was looking not at him. God didn't forsake his son. He forsook the sin that he became because of you. He took the hell that we, that we deserve. She was offered salvation. She could have been saved. That's what they were trying to do was to get her to the place of safety. And then sixthly, remember that God never judges without warning. He always warns. We had a flood some years ago in the United States that killed hundreds of people in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And they went up and down the valley warning the people that the dam had a crack in it and it was, could break at any moment and to evacuate. But the people wouldn't evacuate. The dam broke one night and scores of people lost their lives, but they had been warned. And then seventhly, remember when God warns, there's danger and delay. The Scripture says, prepare to meet thy God. Don't put it off. I want to just stop right there, and I'm going to let him finish this out. But he said, there's danger in delay. There's danger in delay. Don't put off the things that you need to get right with God right now. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'll stop doing that bad habit tomorrow. I'll stop when I know Jesus is coming back in 24 hours. I'll change my behavior. I'll change some sins. Listen, when you're a believer, you start to figure out what's wrong. You start to look at things in your life and you, and you know, you have a conscious, you have a Holy Spirit that says, these things that you're allowing to fester in your life, the anger, the unforgiveness, the sin, the stuff that we allow to sit in our lives, the secret sins, we know. And what he's saying here is don't delay because delay leads to greater danger in your life. The warning is there. The warning right now in our world is going out. Get right with God. We're seeing it in our parking lot, our drive-in services. By the way, this week, we're gonna have drive-in services Tuesday night through Sunday night. We're gonna be doing an Easter production on our parking lot. You'll be able to see it on our screens. I'll be preaching from the rooftop, maybe from a scissor lift as cars are pulling in. And what we saw in these last two weeks as we've done drive-in services is unchurched people are coming, people who've not gone to church in 15 years, 20 years, or ever. And they're coming on our parking lot and they're giving their hearts to Christ. 
and they're crying and they're saying, I'm not right with God. I've been doing wrong things. I've been living wrong ways. I've been doing stuff I know I shouldn't do. These are people who don't know God that are coming to know God and they're heartbroken for their sin. Now it's time for people in the church who do know God and who do know God's word that have things in your heart and your life that aren't right to say, Lord, I repent. This is an hour for repentance. And I'm telling you right now, I'm, I'm a mess. I, like I love preaching hope. I'm a hope filled preacher, but I just felt like tonight was different than this whole weekend. Tomorrow I've got a different message with a different tag team preacher, but tonight I really felt to hit on this whole thing of, are you ready for the end? Are you ready? In fact, just ask the person in your house, your apartment, your dorm room, wherever you're watching this from, if you're all by yourself, I want you to just ask yourself this, am I ready? Am I ready to meet God? Am I ready? If Jesus was to come back tonight, tomorrow, this week, someone sent me a link on Instagram right before church tonight, and the link was from an announcement that was just made in China as of, I believe, this morning. The leader of China, I, I guess they would call him the president of China, the prime minister of China, um, has announced that the only people who will be given um, financial aid during this hour will be those who basically put his picture up in their house in replace of any pictures they have of the cross or of Jesus. There's, there's uh, 60 million Christians in China, actually 90 million Christians uh, in this specific southeast part of China. And he said, if you don't re replace the pictures of Jesus in the cross, and he basically said, Jesus can't save you. Only I can save you. Only the government can save you. These are end times we're living in. I watched the, the whole clip play out. And what I'm trying to say is our world is getting closer and closer to a lot of the things that we read about in the book of Revelation, where people will try to put themselves in front of Jesus, the Antichrist. And what we've got to do is we've got to get our hearts ready. Instead of living in fear or panic or just with this, I don't care mentality, I'm just going to make my TikTok dance videos and the world will go on. You've got to get your heart and your mind right with God. I, I'm all for having fun. I'm all for doing a TikTok dance, but not at the expense of living a life that doesn't please God. Like time is too short to just carelessly live your life as if none of these things matter, as if the end times will never happen. It's happening. It's happening. We're in the middle of it. And my question is, are you ready? Is your heart ready? Are you right with God? Watch the rest of what he shares here. He that hardened his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. Come to Christ while you can. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. I'm going to ask you to flee to the place of safety. The only safe and secure place in this whole world is at the cross of Christ and the open tomb. I'm going to ask you to do something that we've seen thousands of people do this week here in this stadium and in other auditoriums throughout the country. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you, get up out of your seat right now and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I want to be sure that my sins are forgiven and that I'm going to heaven. I want to be sure that I'm in the kingdom of God. You get up and come, hundreds of you. No one leaving the stadium, please, at this holy moment, as people are already coming here. You know, the night I came to Christ, they sang two songs, and I came on the last verse of the last song, and I was a leader in my church, a youth leader. And I'm glad they waited on me. We're going to wait on you. God is speaking to you. There's a little voice inside that says you ought to come. You come. You that are watching in other parts of the world, you get up and you, many people kneel beside their television sets and make their commitment. Some make their commitment lying in bed. Wherever you are, you may be at a bar. We get so many letters from people that watch the television in a bar and they make their commitment or in a hotel room. Don't you let this night pass without you making your commitment. We're going to wait on you from everywhere. You know, just as he's doing that right now, I want to lead you into a time of altar call right in your house. And it's amazing how as he was sharing this, 
Thousands of people began to move towards that stage in that open crusade in Washington state 35 years ago. And we're seeing this happen right now in our city and our drive-in services, but I want it to happen right now in our homes. If you're not right with God and you want to get right with God, now's the time to do it. Don't delay. He referenced in this message a scripture that Jesus said. Jesus said, as he was talking about the end times, he said, it will be like the days of Noah, that when that flood begins to come, only those who are on the ark are going to make it. Can I tell you the ark we have it's not our intellect, it's not our good deeds, it's not our connections, it's not how many sermons we've listened to from our pastor, it is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Our ark is through Jesus Christ, and that ark is available to you. The door is open. The door is open right now to say, I need to get on that ark. I need to be covered during this flood. Jesus died on the cross. We don't live in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. We don't live in the Old Testament. We don't live in the days of, of all of this, but we are coming to a time of revelation, of end times. And there is all kinds of stuff going around us. And the ark, this, the safe place, the shelter at home is in Jesus Christ. It's his presence. And you know, I think the other verse he mentioned was the verse where Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife was so focused on the past. She was so addicted to how she used to live her life. She just couldn't let it go. And here Lot was moving forward. He was coming towards Christ while his wife was looking back saying, I miss the way things used to be. I wish I could go back to how I used to have my, my life, my addictions, my idols, the things that I was comfortable with right now. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Nothing Nothing is going to stand except for the word of God and a relationship with Jesus and what you do for God. I'm gonna ask everyone in this room right now, we've got about 10 people in this room. If you would just bow your heads, close your eyes with everyone at home. And if you're here tonight, you're watching tonight, I mean, from your house, from your hotel, from where you're at, wherever you're watching from, you just heard a message from Billy Graham that I tag team preached. And it's a message right here. Here's the question, are you ready? Are you ready for the end? Are you right with God? What does are you ready mean? It means, is your heart right? Is your life right with God? Is there anything in your life you just need to repent of and make Jesus Christ your Lord, your Savior, your shelter? At your house right now, just make a decision. If that's you, I want you to click right there on where you're watching from. There's a hand to click, a hand to raise to say, I need to get right with God. Click that hand. It's an anonymous hand, but you can click it. If you want to be bold about it, you could just write down in the chat right now on YouTube, on Facebook, on live.victor.com. That's me. I need to get right with God. The Bible says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if we will honor God here on earth, he will honor us before his father in heaven. Jesus says, if you'll honor me, if you'll just say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I repent. Lord, I'm sorry. God, I receive your forgiveness. His mercy is available. His salvation is available. You don't have to do enough good deeds to get it. You don't have to pay money to get it. You don't have to uh, earn enough church points to get it. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I repent of my sin and I ask for your forgiveness. I want to be right with you. I want to be ready when you return that I'm ready to meet you all over this world right now where you're watching from, I want you to just click that hand if you want to do that. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. Just say, Jesus, I repent of all sin and I receive your forgiveness, your salvation. Be my Lord and Savior. I'm all yours. I need you, God. I need you, Lord. I want to be right with you. I want to be ready for you. Use me in this hour to be a light in the dark, to bring hope to those who are hopeless. Use me, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, Jesus.